Before we dive into today's stories, I have a quick shout out for the thrill seekers among you. Over on my other channel, Dread Discovers, I dive into the most bewildering and eerie videos the internet has hidden away. Ever watch something and thought, what did I just witness? That's the vibe on Dread Discovers. So, if you're up for content that'll leave you wondering and maybe a bit unsettled, come on over. You can find the link in the description or simply search for Dread Discovers. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. The story I'm about to tell happened in Oregon's deep forest during one of my many late night hauls. Being a trucker, you get used to the bizarre things that happen along isolated roads in strange towns along the way. It was in the heart of Oregon's infamous woods, where the cell signals vanish and the radio offers nothing but static. The darkness in that area is something else. It's thick and oppressive, shadows everywhere, and when you're driving through the woods, it gets pretty eerie. So, there I was in the inky blackness of an Oregon night, mulling over my solitude in the cab of my rig, surrounded by nothing but silent timber and unseen wildlife. I was hauling along Route 58 at the end of a long day, and I needed to catch a breather. I pulled over at the next available rest stop so I could get a shower and turn in for the night. Unfortunately, the next spot that I could pull off was just big enough to park a couple of rigs and didn't have much for amenities. I was getting tired and didn't want to drive all the way to the next stop, even if it was a little closer to civilization. It was a moonless night, so my only light came from my rig and a dim, flickering bulb in the park sign. I usually would chat with other rig jockeys over the radio, talking about everything from family to football. But the annoying crackle from the radio reminded me I was off the grid. I paced around the stretch, stomping and slapping my sides for warmth, recounting the twists and turns of those ghostly, lonesome roads and looking up into the barren sky. The skies out there were some of the darkest I've ever seen. On clear nights, you could see more stars than you could count. That night, I remember it was overcast and the gray clouds were floating past above in the shadows. Suddenly, a chill rushed over my body, lifting the hairs on the back of my neck. There was an odd smell in the air. At first, I thought maybe it was the vent from the Port of Johns across the way. But no, it was something else. It was sour and rank. I looked above me and the clouds were moving fast. I heard a noise that I thought was the wind, but it was too rhythmic. It was quiet, so quiet that I thought I was imagining it. A low rumble, like distant thunder. The gray clouds filled the sky, but there was no sign of an oncoming storm. Your mind can play tricks on you when you're alone, I suppose. I brushed it off, but it wouldn't let up. And then, I realized that it wasn't the low rumble of thunder at all. It was a growl. I was out there with some animal. That, in and of itself, was enough to put me on edge. I didn't want to be out there with any type of angry animal, even a raccoon. Those things can be nasty. I heard something move towards the bathrooms and my eyes instantly darted towards the line of porta potties. One of the doors moved slightly. I figured then it was either a raccoon or a possum drawn in by the smell of humans, probably looking to see if anyone left behind a snack in one of the trash cans. I was just about to turn and head back to my rig when I heard a loud thud. Something had pushed the entire line of Porta Johns into the parking lot. I whirled around in the direction of the sound, and there, illuminated only by my handheld flashlight, stood the source of my terror. The creature was massive, standing nearly eight feet tall, if not more. Its body was a grotesque fusion of a man and a wolf. It stood on two legs and had the broad shoulders and muscular arms of a man. However, the feet were elongated and angular, like a dog's leg. The whole beast was covered in gray fur, but it was the head that sent shivers down my spine. It had the head of a wolf, though the snout was shorter and wider. But the most terrifying part were its eyes. They reflected back at my light, like a cat's eyes in the dark, white and glowing. The creature surveyed its domain. Its eyes swept the stop slowly and deliberately before finally narrowing in on me. Then, as if just realizing I was there, it twitched a little, tensed up and let loose an echoing roar. As the reality of what stood before me began to sink in, my mind spiraled into panic. 
What was this thing? Some folklore beast wandered out of a storybook, maybe. Was this thing something real that lives in the wilds? Or was it a man-made monster? No matter what it was, it was standing right in front of me, and I had to get away from it. I knew that much. With adrenaline beating through my veins, I quickly backed towards the relative safety of my rig. My hand fumbled for the handle, eyes never leaving the beast as it stood its ground before me. It didn't approach, but it didn't look like it was going to back down either. I breathed a silent sigh of relief as my hand finally made contact with the handle. I opened the door, jumped into the cab, and slammed the door shut. Once inside, I didn't waste a second jamming the key in the ignition, and my truck roared to life. As I hurriedly pulled away from the rest stop, I glanced in my rearview mirror one last time. The creature stood there on two legs, watching as I left. The farther I got away from the encounter, the more muddled my thoughts became. The dread that had threatened to consume me gradually faded, but one lingering question stayed, kept me up during the lonely nights on the road. What was it? I remember it clear as day. I can still picture the golden sand spread across the horizon in the fading sun. I was in the middle of a long road trip, and as the miles ticked by on that long desert road, I found myself pulling into the infamous Roswell for the night. It wasn't one of my planned stops, but I was running a little behind, and I wasn't much for driving after dark, so I figured this was as good a place as any to find some accommodations. There was something undeniably strange about the place. I'm not sure if I was put off by its reputation or if there was really something strange in the air. I parked the car at a remote spot on the outskirts of the town, right in the belly of the desert. I was hoping to get a few photos of the sunset before I went into town to find a room. Maybe not the best plan, but there is something magical about desert sunsets, and I didn't want to miss it. The sky seemed bigger here than in other parts of the US. I unpacked my camera. It wasn't anything fancy, just an entry-level DSLR but I had a little tripod with me and I was putting it together. As the sun began to sink below the horizon, I remember feeling the grit of the sand underneath my feet and the dry wind sweeping past me, but it was the vast darkening sky that had me completely spellbound. It was like the colors of the sunset were dancing like ocean waves. I could see them move in the sky and then all of a sudden it was dark. It's difficult to explain but I felt like I was in an illusion or something. It didn't feel real. In the not too far distance, I heard a coyote's cry echo across the sands. Another responded and a shiver ran down my spine. The air was cold now. That happens in the desert. It's hot as hell during the day, but as soon as the sun goes down, it's practically freezing. The solitude of the desert was as eerie as it was liberating. I remember thinking to myself how it felt like I was the last person on earth surrounded by nothing but miles and miles of barren land, speckled with cacti and other hardy desert plants. I captured a few photos of the moon's ascent before I switched up my lens to a wide angle to catch a wide sweep of the sky. That's when I saw it. There was a slow-moving, indistinct object in the sky above me. I had initially brushed it off as a plane, but there was something strange about the way it moved. It glided with a fluidity that seemed unnatural to me. I decided to capture it on camera just for fun. I had all my camera gear out, so why not? I snapped a couple of photos of the object, and just as soon as I did, it changed course abruptly. Stunned, my heart pounded in my chest as I watched it zigzagging across the night sky, its movements completely defying the laws of physics as I knew them. I was worried that my camera did something to cause its erratic movements, but that wasn't possible. Whatever it was, it probably didn't even see me down here. It took me a moment to realize what I was looking at. I had forgotten where I was, what town I was in, and what it was famous for. I squinted, trying to make out more details as it descended lower. The UFO was saucer-shaped and had a metallic sheen that reflected the moonlight. It almost looked like it was glowing. There were lights, too, rotating along the edge of the vehicle. The lights alternated between green and red and yellow. The UFO made no noise, at least that I could hear. I couldn't see where the engines were or what was propelling it. 
or, for that matter, how it was being steered around the sky. Nothing about it made a lick of sense. Then, as abruptly as it altered its course, it stopped right over me. It hovered there, silent and intimidating, casting a giant shadow over the desert floor. It was the most otherworldly and awe-inspiring experience I'd ever had, but, and I have to admit it, I was terrified. I was honestly afraid it was going to abduct me. I've heard stories of that happening, you know, and it doesn't sound like much fun. I raised my camera to capture it. I figured if it was going to take me that I could at least leave some evidence behind for whoever manages to find my gear. But then the UFO shot straight up into the sky at an impossible speed and disappeared. One moment it was there, and the next it wasn't. Nothing but the wide open sky remained. The feeling that washed over me was of awe and confusion, my mind struggling to comprehend what my eyes had just witnessed. It was quite a while before I mustered the courage to pack my equipment and head back to my car. The drive to the motel in town was a blur, my mind still reeling from the encounter. Was it real? Did I imagine it? Was it some secret military experiment? Or was it an actual craft from another galaxy? There was no way for me to tell. I've since wrestled with the implications of what I saw that night. In the grand scheme of things, the encounter was brief, yet it changed me in ways I couldn't have anticipated. It opened my mind to the idea that we might not be alone in this universe. To this day, I'm not sure if it was a trick of the desert night or if I actually saw a UFO that night. I'm a lighthouse keeper off the coast of Maine, and about a year back, during a particularly violent storm, I had a maritime encounter of a particularly eerie kind. It wasn't something I had ever expected to see, and certainly not anything I could have prepared for. Lighthouses are peculiar beasts. I've worked here for quite a while, and there's a certain homey feeling for me there, but it can get lonely. I've always found them to be a picturesque staple of coastal towns got hired on to keep the old lady up and running, and to make sure her beacon shines bright through any storm. The shoreline here is particularly rocky, and in low visibility can be exceedingly dangerous. There was a storm that night that had been brewing for hours. The air was unmistakably heavy with that salty tang that comes before the weather descends. The sky darkened, thunder rumbling in the distance, and the salty sea spray mist hanging in the air. The waves began their vicious dance in the restless wind. I always found storms beautiful. They're just raw power. My old responsibilities had me checking the equipment, stoking the furnace and making sure the lamps were fully oiled and ready to blast their warning signal through whatever nature was about to throw at us. As I climbed the tight spiral staircase, the old structure would creak and moan under the pressure of the battering storm. She was a good, sturdy building, though. I wasn't worried. The rhythmic hum of the rotating Fresnel lens, casting its light over the wrath of the raging sea, was my sole companion in these lonely heights. The waves, savage as they roared and crashed into one another, had an ominous green hue beneath them. I had to look twice. It wasn't something I had ever encountered before, and I couldn't see exactly what was happening beneath the water. The weather was too rough. Nature was king out here. On clearer nights, the ocean is my only neighbor, and it's a quiet, respectful kinship. But during storms like this, the sea seemed to grow, evolve, taking on a menacing persona of its own. Strange noises were carried with the gusts of wind, groans and bellows that sometimes sounded almost, I dare say, alive. It had an otherworldly feel to it. It was in this state of heightened alertness, amidst the sound of pelting rain, violent winds, the old iron lighthouse groaning as it stood its ground against the storm's onslaught, that I started to experience these visions. I don't know what else to call them. I still have difficulty believing what I saw was real. Even with all the myths and legends surrounding the sea, I was dumbfounded. The weather was getting worse. I braced myself against the window and looked out of the rain-beaten glass. I watched the sea as its waves crashed against the rocks below. In between a misty swirl of rain and foam, I saw something strange, something unnatural. The waves arose, swirling into a whirlpool and roaring, 
again. At first I thought the roars were just the sounds of the angry sea, but now I'm not so sure. The water seemed to transform as a vivid shape rose up from the sea. It was larger than a freight ship. It completely dwarfed its surroundings. I saw a phosphorescent glow, a strange light illuminating this monstrous entity. It was like its skin was glowing. What I thought were giant sea snakes turned out to be the tentacles of what appeared be to be a giant squid or octopus. It twisted and twirled amidst the raging waves. Then the creature rose up even further. I couldn't make out its face, but I could see its eyes. They were large and glowed with the same eerie phosphorescence. They had a hypnotic quality. I don't know if it could see me behind the window of the lighthouse. Logic tells me it couldn't, but as I stared at it, I was sure it was staring right back right at me. I know this next part is going to sound crazy, but as I was looking into its eyes, there were images, like visions that flooded my brain. The picture I saw was of a ship amid a violent storm, similar to the one happening outside. The ship was swallowed by an eager whirlpool, and its crew lost to the raging sea. And then, in the blink of an eye, it all vanished. The vision evaporated, and the monster was gone. In the following days, I stayed tight-lipped about my vision. Who would I tell? Who could understand? It wasn't until weeks later a news report came out about a ship that went down on that wild, stormy night. I remembered my vision. The ship, the whirlpool, and the beast. It didn't take me long to put two and two together. Coincidence? Maybe. Or maybe not. Was it merely stress-induced hallucination, or the tricks of my vivid imagination after spending all that time alone in the lighthouse? Or did I witness something paranormal that night? Still, to this day, every time the weather turns tempestuous and the sea roars beneath my lighthouse, I find myself staring into the storm, awaiting the monster's return. I wonder if anyone out there listening has had a similar experience with a creature like I had, or has some explanation for what I saw that night. I might have just brushed it off as a wandering, tired mind if not for the story of the capsized ship that came out later. But that's my tale, whether you believe it or not. Man, I've got a story for you. I'm a bit of an outdoorsman and enjoy a good camping trip when I can make the time for it. It was a few years back now in the beautiful wilderness of Washington's Olympic National Forest. I had some unexpected time off work, and I decided to fill it with a solo camping trip. I had camped solo years ago, but it had been a while. Normally I go with friends or with my wife, but she couldn't take the time off work for this one. I don't think she was too thrilled about me heading into the woods by myself, but I told her I would be fine. Still, sometimes nature throws you things you just can't plan for which is more or less what happened to me. I arrived at my camping spot on a Friday. My plan was to stay in the woods for an entire week. I remember it was comfortable summer weather. There was a little bit of rain in the forecast, but nothing I was worried about. So I started setting up a comfortable base camp where I could relax for the rest of the day. I've always admired the raw beauty of that place. I swear Washington has some of the greatest outdoor scenery in the world, and I was there for a week to enjoy it. That Saturday, I decided to do a bit of exploration. I had heard about an abandoned logging camp nearby. I have an insatiable curiosity for all things history, and this was right up my alley. You know, there are people whose hobbies are searching for these old camps and abandoned towns. There's quite a few old ghost towns littered across the Mountain West, mostly Montana and Wyoming, but we still have some interesting finds out here. And I was excited to explore what I could. Early in the morning, equipped with a handy map and a few snacks, I made my way into a less traversed area of the forest. I trekked for a few hours towards this forgotten camp, unraveling the trail as nature intended. It was tough going for a while and I had a few tricky water crossings, but eventually I reached the place. It was so deep in the forest that you'd totally miss it if you weren't specifically looking. The place was eerily silent. A lot of it was overtaken by nature's vines and mosses. Abandoned wooden buildings were struggling under the weight of time. There were a few that still stood, but most of the campment had collapsed long ago. You could still see the foundations of the buildings, though. 
Tree saplings were sprouting through the rotting wood structures, and wild brambles gripped the crumbling walls with an uncompromising embrace. I couldn't help but marvel how nature had seamlessly embroidered its narrative within ours. There were a few tools left behind. Odd, I thought. It was like everyone just suddenly left and didn't bother to pack up. There was a rusty saw abandoned near a fallen tree trunk, and the wheels and yoke of a cart left outside of one of the buildings. I found a hammer and a hand drill. As I ventured further, the ambience changed perceptibly. Unfamiliar sounds echoed in the distance, like a rumbling beneath the earth. I didn't quite know what to think, but I guess I just figured it was something normal in the woods. But as the seconds ticked along, my feeling of unease grew more pronounced. An inexplicable sense of being watched enveloped me, every hair on the back of my neck standing on end. Little did I know, there was a surprise waiting for me, one that I was definitely not equipped to handle. As I looked around the camp in detail, I started noticing a peculiar arrangement about things. Fallen logs, seemingly haphazard to the ignorant eye, looked to be meticulously placed in patterns if you were looking the right way. The logs were massive. They couldn't have been moved by one person. There would need to have been a team, or even heavy equipment involved. More than a little unnerved, I continued to explore the area, but I kept my eyes out for anything worrisome. It wasn't long after I had discovered the pattern that something gigantic caught my eye. It was like a moving wall of fur between the trees. At first, I thought it was a bear, and that was enough to put me on edge. There's not a whole lot of creatures in the forest that scare me, but bears are something I'd much rather stay away from. I was starting to backtrack when I saw the creature move again. I couldn't believe what I had seen. Completely taken aback, I hid in some nearby bushes. What I saw could only be described as a living, breathing Sasquatch. In awe and a little terrified, I watched silently as it grabbed one of the logs and stacked it on top of another. It was unbelievable. The creature was like a mixture of a man and an ape. It was covered in dark brown fur, like a chocolate color. It had a very ape-like head and face. The only places I could see that weren't covered in fur were its hands and around its eyes. It was graceful as it walked, not making much noise at all, especially for a creature its size. Its arms hung low. Its hands reached its knees. It looked like it could likely walk on four legs too if it wanted, but it preferred to be upright. It grabbed another log and stacked it. I don't think it noticed me there, and if it did, it didn't care. I watched it for a while from my spot in the bushes. It was clearly building something, but I couldn't figure out what. It would leave for a bit, and then come back with another log. It was during one of those times that I decided to make a break, or it, and run. I left the abandoned logging camp and didn't look back. I'll admit, I would have liked to have stayed longer and observed the creature, but I didn't want to press my luck. Looking back, the event seems rather surreal, an encounter right out of folklore. This experience has heightened my respect for the untamed wilderness and the undiscovered creatures that lie hidden within the forests in our parks. Hopefully we can manage to share the wilderness spaces with them and just go about our separate ways. It happened a few months ago when I decided to explore the infamous Packard plant in Detroit, Michigan. It's an old automobile factory that's been sitting in ruins since the 1950s. It was a big deal back in the day. It's where the Packard Motor Car Company used to churn out luxury automobiles for the upper class. I've always been a bit of a history buff, and forgotten places like this were fascinating to me. And I suppose I was looking for a bit of adventure too. So I decided to go exploring and see what I could find. I started my day with a massive thermos of coffee, my camera, and my headlamp. Now, I'm no fool. I've explored abandoned buildings before. These places have little to no indoor lighting, and they can be dangerous if you're not careful. Rusted machinery, crumbling floors, unstable roofs, that type of thing. This plant, over a million square feet of crumbing industrial decay, is an urban explorer's dream, or nightmare depending on how you look at it. I made my entrance through the remnants of one of the front doorways, which was now just a gaping hole in the side of the wall. Everywhere I looked, it was a cathedral of rust and graffiti. 
Once upon a time, Detroit was the heart of American industry. It's a little surprising to me that this building was allowed to fall into such decay, given its history. Slivers of daylight spill through the broken windows, giving the place an eerie glow. The lighting wasn't too terrible just inside, but it got darker and darker the deeper I went into the structure. The silence was heavy, almost tangible. Through the course of the day, I worked my way through the labyrinth of hallways, photographing the structure. You might be surprised to know that exploring abandoned buildings has become a pretty popular hobby for photographers. You can get some real neat shots in a place like this, where nature has started to creep indoors and reclaim things for the earth. As I explore, I'm aware of every creak, every whisper of wind through the broken windows. This kind of environment has a way of making your senses sharp. Out of nowhere, the atmosphere changed. The air grew heavy all of a sudden, and with it came an unnatural smell. It was damp and musty, almost gamey. Not something I would expect in a place like this. I had this sudden urge to run, to flee the factory, but my curiosity kept me where I stood. I should have listened to that voice in my head. It knew something I didn't. It was a moment before I discovered what was responsible for the fear I was feeling. At first, it was just an outline, a shadow far down one of the gloomy hallways. It looked like the outline of a man, but then it was gone. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was just seeing things. I told myself that it was probably just my imagination, and I continued on my way. I didn't get far before I saw it again. I was surprised at how quiet it moved. No footsteps, no rustling, nothing. It was damn near silent. This time, I thought it was maybe a ghost. The figure was dark, and I couldn't make out any details. I had my flashlight pointed towards the floor, afraid of what I would see if I shined the beam towards the figure. My curiosity got the best of me when I noticed what looked like pointed ears coming out of the figure's head. They were like cat's ears, or so I had thought. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw when I raised my light. The creature standing before me was covered in long gray hair, or fur really. It was standing upright like a man, and had the arms and torso of one. Its legs, however, were something else entirely. From the thighs to the knees, it looked human but further down. Its legs were hocked like a dog's. Its feet were clawed and dog-like as well. It looked like it had hands, but it was difficult to tell from the position it was in. The face, though, that was the worst part. Its head was that of a wolf. There was nothing human about it at all. Its eyes reflected back at me like a wild animal. I was dumbfounded. It looked like a creature straight out of a science fiction film. This couldn't be real, I told myself. There was no way. I stood there staring at it like a deer in headlights, but then the creature moved. It dropped down to four legs and started walking towards me. It wasn't running or leaping or anything, just walking. Somehow that was even more terrifying. I don't know how long I stood there staring at it like an idiot before my survival instincts kicked in and I ran. I ran faster than I thought possible. I ran all the way back through the factory, afraid to look behind me and see that beast chasing me down. I kept running until I reached my car. I remember looking back at the factory, just waiting for the creature to make an appearance in one of the doorways or broken windows, but it didn't. In fact, I don't even think it chased me at all. Let's be honest, there is no way I could have outrun that thing if it had wanted to stop me. I'm not sure why it let me go, or for that matter, what it even was. The only thing I know for certain is that you won't catch me out exploring alone anymore. Not after seeing that. There are so many things in this world that are unknown. If you're an adventurer like I am, you better keep your eyes out for the things that might be lurking in the shadows.